Okay. Let's last bit of material. We're going to talk about bare spaces. Um, so kind of what we've seen is that you know we've seen topology, we've seen there's kind of like this interaction between topology and analysis. And we've kind of seen that the history of topology we mainly focus on the early 20th century. We've seen that somebody basically has some sort of good idea, and then that is then developed and then prove all kinds of different things. So, for example, um, we've seen connectedness. Connectedness is, is an obvious topological thing. Okay, so that's something that people have looked at from the get go. Although, you know, you might we saw there was like connectedness and path connectedness. So it was kind of like different ways of analyzing that. We looked at compactness, and that seemed to be kind of like a natural idea, but you know, they had to be refined a little bit to find the right definition for what compactness would, uh, would be. And you know, this was done in the early, you know, around the 1920s, and that was a, a, a great idea, and that led to a lot of things. We also looked at the idea of um, separating subspaces by continuous functions. And we saw that that actually was really useful. So Urison sort of came up with that and that led to that you know, metricization theorem that led to like partitions of unity. So that led to lots of useful tools. And so we're gonna, have a look at another broad idea by a, a, a long dead mathematician that kind of turns out to be really useful to be able to solve certain types of problems. Um, and so there's this guy, Rene Louis Baer. Um, and he came up idea, with the idea of what we now call uh, Baer spaces. And so the motivation is, um, if you look at in the topological, uh, topological space, you look at closed sets with empty interior, um, they are precisely the boundaries of, of dense open sets. And so, in a sense, these sets don't really matter for, for anything if they've got you know, these closed sets with empty uh, interior. Uh, and so, for example, if you've just got points in R or a curve in R2 or a plane in R3, in a sense, those don't really um, matter in some sort of way. Um, and so he was, so he was, he did this around 1899 in his dissertation. And so this is kind of before topology was really a thing. And he was, an analysis. So they were looking at questions like, you know, how discontinuous can a function be? And so, like, if you put conditions on it, how how much can we force? A, how much? How bad can a function be? So they were looking at those kind of questions. And so this is kind of how he came up with his idea. And um, his idea that a bare space is kind of meaty or large, uh, it's not the countable union of measurable subspaces. For example, R3 is not a countable union of planes, right? You, you can, can't slice up the planes and stick it to get a countable union. Or um, R2 is not a countable union of lines and R is not a countable union of dots. So in some sense, this is, you're getting it to something uh, real about what these spaces are. And so that is, the definition is a bit obtuse, but it turns out to be kind of useful analysis and topology and, and gives new tools in dealing with certain problems. And, and, and it turns out that in topology, um, you can prove these theorems, and in a sense, topology kind of throws away all the 
extra material and it just concentrates on what forces the certain property that you're interested, interested in. And bare uh, spaces seem to do that. And just for example, locally compact household spaces and complete metric spaces, which are you know, basic things that topologists and analysts uh, study, they're examples of their bare spaces. So it's a useful idea and it applies to useful spaces. Okay. So let's get into the technicalities. So as I said, the definition is a bit uh, non-intuitive, but let's have a go. So remember, Tori talked about the interior of a, of a set, and that's the union of all the open sets that are contained inside that set. And so um, to say that a set has empty interior is to say that the set contains no open set other than the open uh, other than the empty set. Um, equivalently, A is empty interior if A, every point A is the limit point of the complement of A. And so that means that if something has empty interior, its complement is dense. Okay, and so the fact that the complement is dense is really where the meat comes in and that you can actually prove things. So what's a bare space? Um, so here's the standard definition of, of a bare space. It's kind of like the closed set definition. In a little bit, we'll see that there is an alternative open set definition. Um, so a space is a bare space if given any countable collection of closed sets of X, each of which has empty interior in X, the, their union also has in, uh, empty interior in X. Um, so you might see this sometimes when people talk about their theory, they talk about category, first category and second category. And we don't like to do that anymore because have you done a little bit of category theory or? Yeah, okay. So category is usually reserved for that. So he used this back in 1899. So people don't like to talk about that. So people don't get confused with category theory. So nothing to do with category theory. Um, so Bear's uh, definition was that a space is a bare, bare space if not, if every non empty open set in X is of second category, what does that mean? Well, a uh, space is of first category if it is contained in the union of a countable collection of closed sets of X having empty interiors in X. Uh, if it's not a first category, then it's a second category. Okay. So, some examples. Uh, so, for example, Q, the rationals, has empty interior as a subset of R. Um, whereas the closed interval 0, 1 has a non empty interior, right? obviously, because it has the, the open interval 0, 1 that contains the sum. But if we put it into R2, then it has empty interior, right? Because 0, 1 cross 0, just because open sets in R2 is a different thing from open sets in R. Um, and uh, another one, the subspace Q cross R has empty interior, the subset of R2. And so straight away, these examples kind of show you that this concept has some, uh, has some meaning because it's going to get at dimension, right? Because dimensionality is going to have something to do with open sets and the fact that open sets are different in R than open sets are different in R2. It's kind of looking at the difference between the, what, the, what the difference is between R and R2 is, which is, of course, dimension. 
like open sets in an n dimensional space are different for different dimensions n. Okay. What about some bare spaces? Um, the rationals is not a bare space. Um, uh, it's the, the rationals are a countable union of its one point subsets, each of which is closed and has non empty interior. But the positive integers is a bare space. At best, that's accurately because every sub, because it's got the discrete topology, every subset is open, hence, there are no subsets having empty interior. So that's a little bit, like I said, that's, that's why it makes it a little bit non intuitive what it is. But um, every closed subspace of R. Being a complete, since a closed subspace of R is itself going to be a complete metric space, right? It's complete because it's closed and it's a metric space because it inherits the metric space from R. That's going to be a bare space. Mm -hmm. um, the middle of zero one is a bare space. We'll see that. We'll see that later. Uh, the set of irrationals and the Cantor set are bare spaces. I might do that one at home, but it would be rational. It's not that hard. I mean, it, it, yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at the alternative definition of a bare space. So instead of using closed sets, let's use open space. Um, X is a bare space if and only if given any countable collection of open sets in X, each of which is dense in X, their intersection is also dense in X. And this is, this is just a reformulation of the definition because Remember the definition was that it's a bare space given any countable collection of closed sets, each of which has empty interior in X, their union has empty interior in X. And so we know that a set is closed if and only if its complement is open, and a set has empty interior if and only if its complement uh, is dense. Uh, and so when you dualize in everything, open sets go to closed sets, Empty interior goes to dense, unions go to intersections. And so it's, it is exactly the same thing. Okay. Okay. Um, just a reminder to a reminder of what a Cauchy sequence in a complete metric space is. So that's just that's an advanced cap, isn't it? Right. So, uh, right. And, and, and the important thing about um, Cauchy sequences, any convergence sequence is a Cauchy sequence, and a Cauchy sequence is only a convergence sequence in a complete uh, metric space. Of course, the standard example being Q, right? So you can have a convergent sequence in Q going to like say the square root of two, but since Q is not complete and the square root of two is not in Q, the coding sequence doesn't converge to something in Q, even though it does in R. Okay, and so here is uh, the reason why bare spaces are relevant. As I said, this is, came from his dissertation in 1899. Uh, if X is a compact household space or a complete metric space, then X is a bare space. Um, interesting, because I read a little bit about his history. So he, he was a student and then he had some health problems. And so he had to leave the university. And so he went to work in a high school. So he taught at a math at a high school. And while he was teaching that 
that's where he wrote his dissertation, published that, and he couldn't get a job as a university professor until, and so he had to teach in high school for years and years, but eventually he did get a, a job in, in a, in, 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 at a university. But he always had kind of like bad health. So it was an interesting kind of story reading about him. Okay. So here's the idea of how we're going to prove that. Uh, so I want to show that uh, if we've got a compact Hausdorff space or a complete metric space, then it's a bare space. So what we're going to do, right? So by the definition of bare space, if we're given a countable collection of closed sets having empty interiors, we want to show that the union has an empty interior. Um, so how do we do this? Well, we do this by showing, given any non-empty open set of X, we want to find a point in that open set that it does not lie in any of those sets A, N. Right? If, there's, if that X lies in none of the A, N, that means that this open set cannot lie within that union of sets. Um, and the way we do that, right, is, well, we start off with our given open set U0, and we're going to use regularity, right, because we've got a compact Hausdorff space or a complete metric space, and the space is going to be regular. So that means we can use that regularity to, to construct a chain of open sets um, such that the intersection of the closures of those open sets would contain X, if such an X, X existed. So what we've got to do is show that this intersection is not empty. Okay. And, um, and we can do that in the case of the compact Hausdorff case by using the finite intersection property. And we can do it in the complete metric space case by using Cauchy sequences. So that's the, that's the goal. So let's do the, the proof. Um, so we're given a countable collection of closed sets having empty interiors. So we look at the first closed set. Uh, it has an empty interior. So oh, we're given that, and we're also given some open set U0. Okay. Since A1 has an empty interior, it does not contain U0. So that means there's a point that lies in U0, but not in A1. Um, since X is regular, we need a compact Hausdorff or a, a metric space, and A1 is a closed set, uh, that means we can choose an, an, uh, another, a new open set U1, and this is going to be a neighborhood of our point Y1, such that intersection of uh, the closure of our open set with A1 is empty. That the closure of U1 is contained within U0. Now, this follows directly from re these two things. We can do that directly because of regularity. And if we're in the complete metric space, let's also throw in the requirement that the diameter of U1 should be less than 1. We can always do that. And I know it's too big to just shrink it down to a ball. Okay. And so we just keep on going. In that way, we're going to construct a sequence of open sets. Uh, oh, that shouldn't be U0. That should be uh, UN minus 1. I guess. So we're constructed. Uh, so uh, yes, it should be UN minus 1, right? So we, we've got our. 
we've got we've got our open set and we want to construct the next open set. So what we can do is we can choose a point which is in our non-open set that we have, but not in AN, and we can do that because AN has empty interior. It doesn't contain you in times one. Okay. And then we take our point YN and we find a neighborhood of it. And that's going to be our UN. And again, it's the same thing because it's a regularity. We can do this. We can have its closure intersected with the AN be empty. And the closure of UN is contained with the UN minus one. Again, we can do that because of regularity. And then we have another condition. If we're in the metric space, we let our, oh, that should be diameter of UN, should be less than one on N. And again, we can do that because if it's too big, we just shrink it down to the, to the wall centered at UN of radius one on N. Okay, so, so any point that's in the intersection of all these closed closures of these open sets would be in U0, right, because we've got to change it, because U1, U0 contains U1, which contains U2, which contains U3. So U0 is inside the closure here. The, the inner, uh, uh, it'll be in U0. And so any X in there would be, like, sorry, would be in all the UNs. So in particular, it would be in U0. But it's not going to be in any AN because of the way we've constructed the sets. Okay. So to prove the, the theorem, we, have, we just need to show that that closure is non empty. Okay, what happens in the compact Hausdorff case? Uh, in the compact Hausdorff space, we've got a chain of closed sets. It's a nested sequence of non empty subsets of X. Uh, it has the finite intersection property since X is compact. And so, therefore, the intersection is non empty. So, we just need compactness for that to be true. So compact Hausdorff spaces are bare spaces. What about complete metric spaces? Well, the proof follows from the following lemma. Uh, anytime you've got a nested sequence of uh, non-empty closed sets in a complete metric space, if the diameter of the spaces is going to zero, then the intersection is going to be non empty. How do we prove that? Um, so, all you've got to do is we choose a point in each CN, we choose an XN for each CN. And the thing that we notice then is that that sequence XN is going to be a Cauchy sequence. Because given any epsilon greater than zero, we can find a capital N such that the diameter of CN is going to be less than epsilon just by choosing N large enough. So we've got a Cauchy sequence. Um, so since it's a complete space, XN has to converge to some X. Okay. Then for any given n, if we fix n, we look at the sub subsequence that starts at xn, that also converges to x. So that means x has to be in the closure of cn, but the closure of cn, of course, is equal to cn. So x belongs to every cn. So in particular, x belongs to the intersection of all the cns. So so this Cauchy sequence converges to a point that's in the closure of all those 
intersection of all those closed sets. And that proves that for the complete metric case. Okay, so what kind of things can we use to prove two things in pair space? So today we're going to have look at the problem. If we've got a sequence of continuous functions converging to a function f, how discontinuous can f be? So we can answer that using pair spaces. The next lecture we're going to do a thing about the continuous nowhere differentiable function. Uh, unfortunately, it's just the existence proof. So it's not a construction. No one's reason I want to do this. Sorry. <laughs> um, and the thing we're not doing uh, that we could have done if we had more time was to show that every compact M manifold space can be embedded into uh, 2M plus 1. Um, so I told you before a definition of, of dimension, and that's uh, Hausdorff dimension. So the idea that you can stretch, you stretch the, the space, how much does it go? That's not really how you actually define it. The way you actually define it is you figure out how many epsilon balls you can fit into your space. And you, you take some limit, like for example, if something's one dimensional, cut it up into epsilon balls, then you have, what is it like one on epsilon is going to be the number of balls that you need to cover a unit interval. Whereas in R squared, right, you do the same thing, you have balls of epsilon, you'll need. Uh, one on epsilon squared to cover it. And then in three dimensions, you need one on epsilon cubed. That's basically the, the definition that I gave you. That basically turns out to be that. So that's called Hausdorff dimension. Um, and there's also Minkowski dimension, which is kind of like it as well. So that's the basic idea. Um, Lebesgue dimension is a different thing. Um, that the thing about Hausdorff dimension and Minkowski dimension is that you can have fractional dimension, which was what makes it interesting. Uh, Lebesgue dimension or only has um, whole numbers like you're used to. And the idea is, okay, if you want to do, Topology. Say, say you want to do some kind of combinatorial topology. So, like something that is one dimensional, it consists of vertices and edges, right? Something that's two dimensional consists of vertices plus edges plus faces. Something that's three dimensional, vertices plus edges plus faces plus I don't know what you call it, solids. And you know, you just sort of go up like this. And the way that LeBay got it got at this is, well, think about covering your space with open, you have a covering, an open covering. Okay, so the order of an open covering is what is the highest number of open sets that a point can, can lie in. Okay. So for example, if you look at something one dimensional, we can think of that as vertices plus edges. So for each edge, you have an open set. And for each vertice, vertex, you have an open set. So the most so in this open cover, the, uh, the order of this open cover is two, right? Because like if you're at this point here, then you're in two open sets. And so the order is 
equal to one plus one more than the dimension. And then the smallest order possible. Yeah, you, it, it's all technical. So you've got to start off with a open cover and then you've got to refine it so it meets certain conditions. And then the, that, that smallest order is one more than the dimension. And then the same thing, if you, you can do it in two dimensions, right? So you'll have like an open set here with the face and then an open set here around each edge and then an open set around each vertex. And again, the order of that open cover is three. So this is something two dimension. So that's, that's a Lebesgue dimension. So, um, anyway, using Lebesgue dimension. And so, may, and so you see, you're doing this co co covering with open sets. And that's kind of how bare spaces come in, comes into it. Uh, yeah. Basically, by using bare spaces, you can prove that that this idea of dimension is what we consider to be dimension. Anyway, here's the question we want to have a look at today. Given a sequence of continuous functions converging to some f, how discontinuous can f be? And the answer is not that much. The set at which set of points at which f is continuous is dense. So you can either think that's a lot or not, right? Because I guess you can say you can have a function which converges at all the rational points and doesn't converge at the rational points. Is that a lot or not? Who knows? Okay. Um, to actually figure out, we've got to prove the following lemma, which is that any open subspace of a bare space is a bare space. Okay. And so you start off with a countable collection of closed sets of what I have in empty interiors in one. So you notice this is kind of like how we proved every, anything is compact, right? We started off with an open cover, whatever, you know, it, all the proofs look the same. Um, so the empty collection of closed sets of Y having empty interiors in Y. So remember Y could be contained within some sort of N. So the closure of A N in second y equals a n, where now we're talking about the closure of a n in x. So if u is a non empty open set of x contained within that closure, then u must, must intersect a n. So that means then that u intersected Y is a non-empty open set of Y contained in AN, but that's a contradiction, right? So uh, the, the closure of AN has to have empty interior in X. And so now, now we, we prove that uh, Y is bare space. So we look at the union of a n, and let's say it contains the non-empty set w of y. So we've got to actually show that w can't exist for it to be a spare space. So then, so if this contains w, then this contains w. But if w is an open set in y, then it's also an open set in X because Y is open in X. Um, but each of these has empty interior in X because X is a bare space. And so hence, there is no such W. And so hence, 
is union of a n has empty interior, and so hence y is a bare space. Now that we've got that lemma out of the way, we could get to the main act of today. So let's say we have a, a, a space X and we have a metric space Y. And let's say we have a sequence of continuous functions Fn that go from X to Y. And we have that at each point, Fn of X converges to some, something which we'll call F of X for all X in X. So this then defines a function that goes from X to Y, right? So we just define F of X to be the limit of Fn of X, which we, told, which we are told exists. So if X is a bare space, the set of points at which f is continuous is dense in x. Okay. And so I like this proof because it kind of gives you a sense of why bare spaces are kind of important. Because how else would you prove such a statement? So here is the proof. Okay, so for any epsilon greater than zero, we're going to um, construct a set U epsilon with the following properties. This, uh, this set U epsilon is open and dense in X, and our function F is continuous at each point of u1 intersected u a half intersected u a third intersected so on so on and so on okay now if we can do this if we can come up with a set of of open dense sets like this and we can show that the f is continuous at all these points then we're done if x is a bare space Right, because we're just using lemma 48.1 about the open set definition of bare space, right? If these, if these spaces are open and dense, then this intersection is open and dense by, um, uh, by that definition. Okay. So how do we construct our open dense sets? Um, well, we're going to be doing Cauchy sequences again. So let's, given an epsilon and given a positive integer n, we're going to define this space, which depends on n and epsilon, by the set of points x. So the distance between Fn of x and Fm of x is less than or equal epsilon for all n and m greater than or equal to n. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that this is a closed set, right? Since if you fix an n and m, then that set is closed because of the continuity of the functions Fn and Fm. But then this a n epsilon is then just the intersection of all those sets for all the different n and m's greater than or equal to n. And we know that the intersection of closed sets is closed. So that define that's a well-defined closed set. So let's fix epsilon and consider this chain of um, this chain of closed sets. A1 epsilon contains then A2 epsilons. Okay. 
right? So it's increasing, right? Because as n increases, we're intersecting less sets. So it's a, it, so the, so it gets bigger as the thing goes. Okay. Now the important thing to notice is that the union then of all the sets for a fixed epsilon is the entire set X. And that's because given any point in X, the fact that the sequence converges to a, to a, to a value implies that this is a Cauchy sequence. And so Y is going to be in one of these A and epsilons for some N. So we've got an increasing, we've got a nested sequence of closed sets increasing, going to, and in the limit, it goes to the whole set X. And so now we were, now we can define our set of interests. U epsilon, we just want to be the union of the interiors of all those uh, close uh, close sets. Okay, so now we've got to show that it's open again. So it's clearly open, right? because it's the union of open sets. So it's open. So why is it dense? Okay, so let's say we have a non-empty open set of X. So we start off with our open set. We intersect it with this closed set. So that's going to be a closed set in, in V. Here's where we need the lemma. X is a bare, bare space, so therefore V is a bare space since it's an open set of X. So that means... Um, at least one of these sets must contain a non-empty open set W of V. So that means V is intersecting one of these interiors. So that means it's dense. So if that's true for every open set, if every open set intersects some interior of one of the AMs, then every open set intersects the union of all the AMs. So therefore the unions of all the AMs, the interior of all the AMs is dense. Finally, we've got to just show that the function f is continuous at each point of C. So remember what C is? C is the intersection of u over 1 over n. So let's say we've got a point at C. So we want to show that the function is continuous at y. Okay. So we're going to use an epsilon on three arguments. This is just standard advanced calc. Okay, so given our epsilon, we choose our k such that one and k is less than epsilon and three. So that means y is in u of one of one on k. Um, so that means it has to equal a capital from the definition of this. There has to exist a positive integer n 
such that Y is in the interior of that space. Okay, and so given that N now, if we look at F of N, it's a continuous function. So therefore, there is a neighborhood W of Y contained within this AN such that the distance um, between Fn of x and Fn of y is less than epsilon 3 for all x in that table. So that's just using the continuity of f and n. Next. Since W is in this space here, then for a fixed X in, in W, um, the distance between F little n of X and F big n of X is less than one on K for every little n bigger than or equal to N. Okay? So since this is true, we can now just let N go to infinity, little n go to infinity. Right, this is going to go to f of x. So now the distance between f of x and f n of x, it's not good. we've got to replace this less than one on k, of course, by less than or equal to one on k. But we've chosen one on k to be less than epsilon one three. So this distance now is less than epsilon one three. In particular, our point Y that we started off is in, is in W. So the distance from F of Y to Fn of Y is less than epsilon minus three. And now I think we've done it, haven't we? Uh, we now put all those three inequalities together by the triangle inequality. Uh, uh, What do we want? We want the distance between f of x and f of y to be less than epsilon. So f of x is epsilon 3 from that. That is epsilon 3 away from that. And that is epsilon 3 from f of y. So therefore, f of x and f of y. Is less than epsilon, and so we've got our continuity. That's not a bad little theorem, I think. Right, so to prove that still that f is continuous at y, we've got to show that the distance between that and that is less than epsilon. Okay, so this guy is epsilon on three from this guy. That guy is epsilon on three from this guy. And this guy is epsilon on three from f of y. And so by the triangle, triangle inequality, we just add up all these things to get epsilon, which is what we want. And so the whole idea of the bare space was it just kind of encapsulates denseness into a useful concept that can be used to actually prove things. That's that.